Welcome to my channel people author link will be on description one fateful day that changed the world. One fateful day that changed the life of Izuku Midoriya. In a world falling into darkness, where only a few heroes stay true and where villains run rife, one boy who inherited a quirk that takes the quirks of others tries to change the world without any delay let's start the story just about everyone could tell you exactly where they were that day. The exact time, what they were doing, how they felt, what the sky looked like from where they were standing. It's the nature of national disaster, something that so radically changes the face of a society and pushes history down a path it will never be able to turn back from. It is impossible to forget. For the little guy, for him and his family, they were far too close to the epicenter for comfort. At the time they had been going on a school picnic before the sky turned black, before all they could feel was raw, primal fear. But if you saw the battle that they did, survived what they did, you'd remember that day better than any other. Remembering bad things that happen to you is your mind's way of protecting itself, trying to keep itself from living through that trauma ever again. And if you're a kid, just a little, innocent child who'd never once seen the uglier sides of life, that staying power doubles, and the memories change you. Your nightmares revolve around them, your convictions shape around them, your resolve is tainted by them. They change you. When the memory begins, the first thing he remembers, whoever he recounts the story to, was sitting on the swings alone. Other children were running about and playing, using their quirks superpowers inherited from birth to have a rather energetic round of tag. The poor thing, alone on the swings, didn't have a quirk. He was a freak of nature, along with 20% of the population who was born like that. And the others knew. The others wouldn't let him forget. Why does Bakugo always get to be the hero? One child whined, crossing his arms. The short and fiery Katsuki Bakugo, his palms crackling with small explosions, just cackled. Because if any of us is going to become the next All Might. He pointed toward a screen that loomed over the park, some distance away. At that exact moment, it was broadcasting an interview with the man Bakugo had just mentioned. It's gonna be me. Sighing, the other boy just went quiet, but another one piped up in his place. Why is he called the, symbol of peace, anyways? Bakugo rolled his eyes. Are you stupid or something? It's because he's so awesome that criminals are afraid to be bad, even when he's not around. Bakugo flashed a wicked grin, cackling under his breath. Because of that, we don't have a bunch of stupid villains running around making the world a war zone. He's so strong he doesn't even have to throw a punch to keep evil in its place. Scratching the side of his head, that same boy gulped. So. What do you think will happen if he dies? Bakugo looked at him like his brain had just fallen out of his head. Wouldn't more villains show up and make the world, scarier? At this, Bakugo just laughed hysterically. Wow, you're even dumber than you look. Something like that will never happen, stupid. Fate can always be tempted. It finds it very hard to resist temptations like those. In that moment, as far as the child alone on the swings was concerned, Bakugo was absolutely right. All Might really was that powerful, and there was nothing that would ever change that. No villain or other force on earth would ever be strong enough to kill or even hurt him. But that wasn't what was on his mind. Some distance away he watched as his mum and dad seemed to be arguing, quietly. They were avoiding making a scene, but nonetheless were not able to avoid airing their dirty laundry in public. Not that he knew, he was still too young to know that. To him, they just looked upset, perhaps at each other. His mother's face was quivering, trying not to let tears out, and his father wasn't even looking at her. Not that he could remember his father's face, even now. Looking back he knew this was the end of their relationship. Everything had changed in so many ways after that day, and that was just one of them. It wasn't the thing that everyone would remember, though. That came now. The world erupted with explosions. A pair of bodies had crashed into each other, then hit the ground near the school so hard they left a crater in the road. Hurricane force winds sent almost everyone flying as people ran screaming. The boy was thrown off the swing, and as he pulled himself up from the dirt, grabbing at the frame of the swing to steady himself, the bodies pulled themselves from the ground and started throwing punches at each other. This was no sloppy spur of the moment brawl, this was something else, a rapid and calculated exchange of blows. Their fists struck each other with such ferocity and so regularly that the wind force created from the impacts shook the buildings around them, smashed the glass in windows. 
civilians and children fled the scene as quickly as they could, leaving the little kid behind. Grasping onto the swing even tighter, the little guy's eyes went wide. The All Might. The symbol of peace didn't hear him, and why would he? He was far too busy fighting for his life. A decisive strike sent the villain flying right past the kid, crashing through a building in a blast of rebar and fire, and All Might followed in a blur. From what the kid could see, the villain was dazed and All Might had his senses completely in hand. Taking advantage of this, All Might grabbed his enemy and started using him as a battering ram against the ruined building around them. Tossing him around like a rag doll, he threw the villain through girders and walls, as if trying to hit him with everything he could find. What terrified the boy in that moment was how oblivious All Might was to the devastation that he himself was causing. So focused was the symbol of peace on the fight before him that the office building they had crashed into toppled to the ground, rubble flying around them in a rain of devastation. All Might never lost track like this against villains, he was fighting like a wounded animal trapped in a corner, ferocious and scared and hell-bent on the outcome. Hurling his fist into his opponent's mask, he saw the translucent metal dent and crack. His attention flickered for a second and his punishment was a heavy smack to the head, from his enemy smashing a rock into his skull, blood flowing from the wound above his eye. In retaliation, All Might ripped a whole emergency stairwell from the rubble and slammed it into his enemy's head from above, crushing him down like one might crush rocks with a sledgehammer. As the dust settled it appeared he'd driven his opponent into the earth as though he were an oversized nail. For a few moments all seemed quiet. Ripping his way upwards, freeing himself from the earth, the villain uppercutted All Might's chin. Sending him flying through some nearby wreckage, he saw his chance. Flying forward, fingers ready to deliver a lethal jab, he summoned one of his many quirks. Thrusting his hand forward his fingers stabbed straight into All Might's ribs. Reflexively, the hero recoiled from the injury, grabbing the wrist of his enemy. Spinning around mid-air he smashed the masked villain through the wreckage below them. Preparing to strike his opponent with. Another earth-shattering blow All Might suddenly felt a searing pain. As his muscles contracted from the pain his hand clutched at his left ribs. Something was wrong. This injury wasn't a simple puncture. He crashed into the wreckage above his nemesis. All Might, shakily, rose to his knees. Pulling his shirt up he saw his very flesh rotting away. Spewing blood from his lips he suddenly realized what had happened. So you stole another, All Might was interrupted by a fist carving its way through the debris beneath him. As he was punched clean under the jaw he somersaulted back into the street. His injured ribs kept him off balance and he crumpled to the ground in a heap of muscle. The villain leapt into the road after him some 30 feet away, part of his mask obliterated by All Might's onslaught. Through the cracks in the mask, one glowing red eye shone with terrifying intensity. Blood, steaming on the metal, flowed from his wounded face. All Might saw the end result of his last victory against this man. His eyelid and the skin around his eye was gone, torn asunder by the punch that ended their last bout. As the hero's eyes widened and his smile vanished, he realized the reason behind this blind fury, his archenemy had decided the intensity of their rivalry had gone beyond. I told you, All Might. This is the end. No matter what, at least one of them was dying today. Groaning from the pain, All Might rose to his feet. He hated to admit it but that looked to be the way this fight was headed. He could feel the effects of the newest quirk inside his body, his organs were rotting as he faced the personification of evil. And I told you, you will be stopped. Because I am here. Not this time. I will kill you today. You may try, his voice was weak, but if that's the case, he returned to his combat stance, ready to strike back or defend himself, then I'm afraid I can't hold back. Good, and his nemesis fell into his own combat stance, let this be our final battle, all might. Put everything you have into it, because I, his eye narrowed, his bloodlust was unmistakable, will enjoy your demise. All might's smile returned, and how many times have I heard that before? In the blink of an eye they were striking at each other again. Flying about in the air, devastating what remained of the buildings around them, they tore their knuckles into each other's flesh. Blasts of wind pressure, raging outward from them in all directions, sent rubble flying further into the city. Buildings were leveled, entire city blocks were reduced to shambling husks. It was like three tornadoes had hit this part of the sprawling metropolis simultaneously. From the frame of the swing, 
huddled to the ground and covering his head with the arm knot clinging on for dear life to the swing frame, the child saw everything. Quivering, quaking, he just wanted this to end. All Might had to just win already. He had to beat the bad guy and make everything safe again. Unfortunately, it was beginning to become clear that All Might was losing. Taking a deep breath he formulated a desperate plan. This either ended in his victory or the entire world would suffer the consequences of his defeat. Landing on the ground, he stared right up at his enemy. He was soaring down like a homing missile, hand ready to jab at his already injured side. All Might merely smiled. He knew he was going to go for that. Forcing all of his power several times over into his right arm, his left hanging there like a broken wing, he braced himself. His enemy struck true, driving his hand clean through All Might's ribs. Blood spattered across the ground, pouring down All Might's side, as his organs and flesh rotted like rancid meat in the sun. The internal damage had been more than fatal. A sickeningly gleeful smile spread across the ruined face of the villain. He'd won. Or had he? Shattering those dreams in an instant, All Might retaliated as never before. United, he choked, blood spouting from his mouth, states of, his voice raised in volume, smash. Shouting at the volume of an erupting volcano he swung his fist into the air, bringing it down straight onto his nemesis's head. Unleashing the entirety of his quirk's collective power he blew a crater into the ground beneath them so deep that the sewer pipes beneath burst into an explosion of water amidst the fire. The force of the punch sent the air rocketing away and ignited it. Flames engulfed the area around them in a bubble. Then, as the laws of physics slowly realized what had happened, the air rebounded, collapsing back in on itself a second shockwave was created. Emanating outwards, like the force of an atomic bomb, the remaining rubble was erased from the ruined city around them. The boy leapt to his feet, daring to step forward when the wind finally subsided. All Might. He screamed. As the dust settled, the child saw All Might lying inert upon the rubble. Charging forward, the little guy starting shaking his motionless form. Even as he desperately tried to wake him, screaming his name and begging him to wake up, reality had slowly started to sink in. The body he was touching, was growing colder by the second. All Might, was dead. A hand grabbed the child's shoulder, spinning the crying boy around. Eyes wide with terror, the boy saw a single, bloodied, glowing, red eye staring into his. The villain was alive, and he was touching him. He was going to die. The child opened his mouth to scream only for the villain to jam his hand inside. Blood poured into the child's mouth, and he started screaming through his nose. That is, until the villain pinched his nose shut and waited. The kid couldn't breathe, he couldn't breathe. The villain's body was, trembling, the light in his eyes flickering. He was, weak, possibly dying, but that didn't change the fact he couldn't breathe. His hands clawed at the villain's, trying to make him let go, but he never did. Doctor. The villain's voice was faint, barely even audible over the wheezing of his own breath. Drink. And I. Let go. Never in his life would the little one forget the vile, slimy feeling of the fluid oozing down his gullet. The flavor, the horrid need to wretch that followed, but he did as he was told. Even with so little of his face visible, the villain smiled as he collapsed. While the child gasped, his body heaving as he was finally able to breathe again, he wheezed out one word. Name. The child, despite his trembling knees, despite his overwhelming fear, answered. Aizuku M. Midoriya. Still smiling despite his pain, the villain nodded. Do. You have a quirk. Feeling like the smallest creature on earth, he shook his head. No. Then, in an almost friendly way, the villain chuckled. Well, it's, your, world now. As he gently spoke, Izuku felt his fear fading, watching the light fade from his eye. Use, your power well. Then his eye closed, and he went as still as all might. He was dead too. Completely unsure what he'd meant, Izuku just stared at the lifeless body, completely at a loss for words. Then, on instinct, he started wandering away from the scene. Somewhere far away, he heard his mother screaming out his name, then his wandering turned to sprinting. His father was nowhere to be found, and would later be counted among the dead, but he had his mom. Amidst the spiraling chaos the world was about to become, in the years that followed, she'd be among the few good things she had. Sadly, she would claim the same about him, for the boy who questioned Bakugo was right. Without all might, his powerful presence keeping villains scared, 
the world would soon see just how many people were willing to turn to crime to get what they so desired, and just how far heroes could fall. The world was headed into darkness now. But in that moment, crouched over the body of his fallen idol and choking back the bile that was coming from the taste of the villain's blood, eight-year-old Izuku Midoriya had no idea of the part he would play in the future of this world as it lay in darkness. In the future, they would remember this day. They would call it Incident Zero. It's not going to happen, I'm afraid. Words that struck like hammers through glass, smashing his world to smithereens. When the doctor said he'd never be a hero, not without a quirk, all he could do was sit there and stare straight ahead. Days, weeks went right on by and he didn't say anything to anyone. He just remembered finding that clip, that one clip of All Might, the first clip. The rest was already a teary blur, all he remembered was asking his mother if he had a chance of ever being like All Might. All she could do was hold and weep, apologizing over and over. The day that followed All Might's death, he couldn't do much more than sit there and stare again. Cameras, teary-eyed reporters with lines on their faces from fear, so many voices all at once. All for the boy who was there. Right there. Questions he couldn't answer, anxieties he couldn't soothe, fears he couldn't assuage. All the while his mother sobbed, inconsolable at the disappearance of his father. Little Izuku just felt, numb. Like his whole body had been motionless for far too long, circulation no longer flowing. Eventually, they just wandered home. Lines of houses, all with bright paint that hadn't chipped. Lush green trees, bushes and grass trimmed and hedged. Windows were clean and clear, cars polished and repaired. Roads were smooth and dark, the lines painted bright and fresh. So idyllic a place to go home to, and be miserable, so bold a contrast to the war zone in which he had been trapped. Phone calls came in, in the days that followed, one by one. The insincerity of the sympathy from some of his mother's friends made him choke back tears, almost as much as the call from his father's parents where they screamed their frustration and sadness to high heaven, blaming her for letting daddy die. Izuku just hugged her, squeezing her tight. It's okay, mama, if All Might couldn't stop it, how could anyone? The first reasonable or sensible thing anyone had said to her in almost a week, and it was from her own baby. Her response wasn't much more than picking him up and squeezing until both their arms hurt. Eventually, when she'd fallen asleep, Izuku let his numb and empty mind decide what he did next. A long walk, with no destination in mind. Little feet in little red shoes carried him along streets filled with mourners holding candle-lit vigils. Children were crying at the death of the world's greatest hero and idol to all, parents were holding each other as they stared fearfully at the odd future ahead. Maybe he wasn't so different, but they were trying to make themselves feel better. He wasn't. It wasn't easy to decide if that was a good or a bad thing, so he didn't try. Mental energy was in short supply right now, better to save it for things that really mattered. Hours passed, and his body wasn't in a place where it could tell how tired it was anymore. It was only after it got dark that he went home and curled up on the couch next to his mother. When morning came, he got up on his own dressed and had cereal, then walked to school. Just like every other day now, he couldn't really hear what was being said by almost anyone. This time, grief was a barrier too, not just being their outsider. Considering it was their first day back since All Might's death, the teacher just decided to ease them back into the swing of things. However, when their break time came, things did not stay so relaxed. Two sets of little arms grabbed Izuku and started dragging him, and before he knew it he was behind the shed and staring down Bakugo. Quivering shoulders, bared teeth and piercingly furious red eyes that burned holes into Izuku's face, Kachan looked demonic. His voice wasn't any different. It was your fault. Izuku blinked. H huh. Bakugo snarled, it was because of you. Tears pushed themselves out of his eyes, little explosions popping in his palms. You're the reason All Might died. His jaw dropped, eyes fluttering and going wide as his heart cracked. And no. That's not. Shut up. Bakugo's fist flew like an arrow, hitting his face almost as hard. If he didn't have to protect you, then he would have won and been fine. Shut up and take your punishment you, stupid, worthless Deku. With every punch and blast of Bakugo's quirk, a cold desperation pooled in Izuku's chest. Pain in his ribs, face and jaw, the other two boys gripping his arms so hard he'd almost certainly have bruises. Stars flashed in front of his eyes, blood dripping from his lips and nose. 
Bakugo only hit him harder, used his quirk more and more. Izuku's clothes were burned, his flesh singed and charred and his hair smoldered. Electricity moved through his body like ice through his veins, wondering if Bakugo was going to kill him. The harder he hit, the louder the explosions, the more that seemed to be likely. Struggling to get away, finding it to be a useless gesture, desperation began to claw at Izuku's brain, black and red began to fill his eyes. He had to do something, had to fight back. But how could he? He didn't have a quirk or the strength to do that. Why don't I have a quirk? Why is life? Bakugo pulled his fist back again, roaring like a lion as he went for the killing blow. Die. So unfair. Then maybe, you should make it more fair. A flash of black, a shockwave pulsing outward and all four boys went flying in different directions. Izuku was left lying on his back, Bakugo's stooges groaning as they rolled weakly on the ground. Red sparks flickered between Izuku and the other two boys, but not between him and Bakugo, before winking out of existence. Groggily, with the worst headache of his life, Izuku forced himself to sit up. Sitting up as well, Bakugo blinked. What just happened? One by sniffled, his eyes shining with water pooling in them. I, I don't, then he started sobbing into his palms. When the other boy did too, Bakugo snarled at them. What the hell? Why are you babies crying? Neither of them could answer, far too busy being overcome with emotion. Not one to waste an opportunity, Izuku took this as his moment to flee for his life. Bakugo was screaming for him to come back, raving, but Izuku was done listening to him. Red sneakers skidded and scuffed along the ground as he ran, no concept of time in his mind. Heartbeat hammering away, cold sweat on his skin, he fled without thinking about the destination. Eventually, chest heaving as he leaned against a wall to stay upright, he finally felt calm enough to stop. My. Fault. A fist clenched. No, that made no sense. All Might hadn't even known he was there, neither had the villain. Izuku wasn't the reason their hero was dead, he couldn't be. All the same, palms to his eyes, he started sobbing. He just stood there, against the wall and crying, for the longest time. Then, as he slowly quieted, he still heard someone sobbing uncontrollably. Sniffling, Izuku looked up. And tried to find the source of that voice. Wiping at his nose and eyes, Izuku cautiously wandered over across the street to a crouched person. The person he could hear was just another boy with shaggy ice blue hair and the rattiest hoodie, jeans and sneakers he'd ever seen anyone wear. When he looked up, with his bloodshot and glassy eyes, he saw a mole just under the right corner of his lips. He couldn't be much older than Izuku, just a couple of years at most. Who are you? Izuku said, kneeling beside him. Reddish-brown eyes stared into Izuku's green ones, searching for something like a frightened cat. Not seeing anything alarming, the other boy murmured, as he relaxed. He wiped at his face with a hand stained by old, dry blood. The lack of visible injuries on his skin somewhat telling. Tenko, he spoke with a small voice, pitiful enough that Izuku couldn't help but feel sorry for him. My name is Tenko. Smiling, the green-haired boy offered him a hand. I'm Izuku. Cautiously, a hand reached out and grasped his, and Izuku thought it strange that the other boy was making sure to leave his pinky far away from Izuku's skin. Nice to meet you. After shaking his hand, Izuku shuffled around and sat next to him. So, why are you crying? Looking the other boy over again, he saw no small amount of dust covering his clothes. Blood stained the fabric and his skin in a few places, and there were bruises just beneath his collar. Did someone hurt you too? Thinking about this for a moment, Tenko nodded. Yeah. His hands balled up, tightly, so much so his knuckles went white. Not knowing what else to say, Izuku went with his feelings. Can I help? Tenko shook his head. It doesn't matter anymore. Standing up, sniffling and wiping at his face some more to clear the tears, he sighed. That questline is cut, can't be completed without the NPCs anymore. Izuku stood up too, not quite getting what Tenko was talking about. Are you sure? Yeah. Tenko looked Izuku up and down. What about you? Who messed you up? Laughing nervously, Izuku mumbled. My friend Kachan, his name is really Katsuki Baku, no he's not. Izuku blinked. Huh. Tenko was glaring off to the side. If someone hurts you that badly. He pointed at the various cuts, bruises and burns on Izuku's skin and clothes. They're not your friend. They're a villain. 
a jerk, an enemy worth only farming XP from. Scratching the back of his head, Izuku gave a lopsided frown. What's XP? The blue net sighed. Just, he's not your friend, okay. Friends don't hurt each other without saying sorry. Feeling his heart sink, hugging himself and staring at the floor, his next words weren't even really a squeak. He wanted to argue, really he did. He wanted to fight tooth and nail for Kachan given how they'd grown up together, how close his mother was with Kakan's parents. But with a horrible sinking realization, he knew he couldn't deny the truth in Tenko's blunt words. Quote dot dot dot. Oh. Reaching forward with a closed fist, Tenko offered a small smile. But I'll be your friend. Immediately, Izuku's face warmed, and he felt the happiness inside him rise. Really. He paused as Tenko nodded, still smiling. Even though I'm. Q quirkless. With a shrug, Tenko replied. A. Hey, just less chance of you using a dumb quirk to hurt people with. Trust me, you're kind of lucky. Looking at Tenko's fist, just waiting there, Izuku reached out and did the one thing that made sense. He made his own fist and tapped his knuckles against those of the other boy. Yeah, maybe I am lucky. He smiled at the other boy, the one who had shown him more kindness in moments than Kachan had in years. But not because of that. Snickering, Tenko put his hands in his pockets. Lame. Taken aback, Izuku's face flickered with shock, confusion and then indignity. Nah uh. Now Tenko was laughing. Yeah, a little. As Izuku pouted, his grin became sincere. Thanks for cheering me up. Now it was the green-eyed boy's turn to smile. You too, Tenko. Seeing that the sun was setting, Izuku decided he'd better get going home. They said their goodbyes and went in different directions. Izuku would go home to a sobbing mother, worried sick about him leaving school like that and would go to bed feeling terribly guilty. But he had made a friend. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. At school, the next day, Izuku would be met with an apologetic teacher and two very depressed students who didn't so much as not all day. Bakugo's friends were very torn about something, but no one could make them say. When lunch break came, they just sat there, watching the other children play with their quirks in stone-cold silence. All the yelling, screaming and goading in the world from Bakugo wouldn't make them move. They just stared with eyes full of cold, mindless envy at their classmates while Izuku sat at a table and drew in his notebook. He didn't know why their eyes widened when they looked at him, or why cock, no, Bakugo's eyes wouldn't meet his. You don't know what you did, do you? He had no idea why he'd asked himself that, but he didn't know, that much was true. When school ended for the day, Izuku would wander home and find the biggest surprise of the day. Tenko was waiting for him on the front steps, talking to his mother. It was the happiest he'd seen her in a month. Welcome home, little Izu. She bounced to her feet and picked him up, hugging him close. Laughing up a storm, Izuku hugged her back. Thanks mom. Petting his little head and kissing his cheek, she plopped him back down on his own two feet. When were you going to tell me you made a friend? Bashfully, Izuku scratched the back of his head. Um, well, we just met yesterday. Tenko explained. I was all sad and junk, but he cheered me up. Inko turned and gave her boy a smile, eyes twinkling with pride. Well, of course he did. Izuku blushed, but still turned to look at Tenko. How did you find out where we lived? He giggled. You stalker. Tenko's eye twitched. Damn brat. I asked one of your classmates how to get here. I had some games I wanted to show off to you. Inko ushered them inside. Well then who am I to get in the way of you playing? Come on you two, dinner will be ready soon before you play, and I think. Tenko. The blue net nodded. You can put that bag down in the living room. It looks quite heavy. Grabbing the strap on his shoulder, the older boy adjusted his backpack. Yeah, it's all my games as well as my gaming console oh crap. At the touch of all five fingers, the strap turned to dust and the backpack dropped. Only by leaping forward, his palms outstretched and snagging under the falling bag, did Izuku save the precious cargo. His stomach hit the ground and the wind was immediately knocked out of him, stars in his eyes as his wounds from yesterday ached. Izuku. Inko leapt to his side. Are you hurt? She pulled him up and dusted him off, checking him over for any sign of further injury. Embarrassed, Izuku shook his head. I I'm okay, mom, really. Making sure not to touch it with all his fingers this time, Tenko picked up the backpack with a timid, sullen expression. Sorry. Izuku shook his head. 
Don't worry about it. Grinning, he gave a thumbs up. Is everything okay? Unzipping the back, he looked everything over. Yeah, looks fine. Zipping it back up, he shyly nodded. Thanks for the save, can't exploit and clone this stuff if it breaks. Both Midorias blinked. What? Feeling self-conscious, Tenko slung the bag over his shoulder. Nothing, never mind. With that they went inside, and Izuku noticed how Tenko was doing his best not to touch anything with all of his fingers. So, your quirk turns stuff to dust when you touch with all your fingers at once. Sighing, putting the backpack down, Tenko nodded. Yeah, it's awful. I have no other way to control it either. After some thought, a light bulb might as well have gone off over Izuku's head. I've got it. Running to the closet, he rummaged around until he found some simple, fabric mesh gloves. Running and grabbing some scissors from his room, he cut off all but the middle two fingers. Then he turned them inside out, and put some electrical tape around the inside of the remaining fingertips and set them right again. Here. He offered the gloves to Tenko, smiling brightly. Try them. Skeptically, Tenko reached out and accepted them, carefully putting them on. When he made a fist and nothing happened, his face lit up with the biggest smile his face could make. You're a genius. He jumped forward and hugged Izuku, both of them laughing up a storm. When dinner came, they all sat around the table and ate katsudan together, chatting about various things that held no real meaning. Laughter, food and pleasant company helped all three forget the world outside. Afterwards, the boys helped her clean up and then set up to play the games Tenko brought over while Inko read a book, occasionally looking up and asking them about what they were playing. It was just some old role-playing game back from when Inko was a little girl, one of the few cooperative games in the collection that Tenko had somehow packed into his bag. For a moment or two, Tenko looked like he wanted to play one of the fighting games, squaring off against Izuku one-on-one, -on -one, but decided otherwise. Nothing ruins a friendship like a good competition, so the old saying goes. When the sun finally started setting, Tenko packed up his games and went home, giving them both a hug goodbye before he left. Both of the Midorias could clearly see the change in his personality. Whereas the older boy had slouched when he first arrived at their home, and hung back from everything with some uncertainty, he seemed to almost have a spring in his step. Almost. Patting her son's shoulder, Inko gave him an affectionate squeeze. I think giving him those gloves was wonderful idea, little Izu. Why's that? Inko pulled him back into the house, locking up for the night. Did you see how happy he was? Izuku nodded and she giggled. Well, I think you made a lifelong friend today. He almost exploded with excitement. You think so? Shrugging, smiling coyly, Inko did her best not to answer too directly. Maybe. We'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Humming happily, Izuku nodded. Guess so. His teeth brushed and his face washed, Izuku kissed his mother goodnight and headed up to bed. His room was still full of All Might figurines and posters, special edition action figures lining every available shelf space, but the den of a young boy's dreams had become something far more forlorn, a shrine to an age that once was. He wouldn't dare get rid of them, even with the memories they gave him. As he drew the covers up around him and drifted off, he blinked away one tear, but not one of sadness. This was one of hope. A lifelong friend. Maybe his mother would be right. Wouldn't that be nice? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Izuku and Tenko. Aged. 8 and 10. Makoto Kobayashi here with your morning news. Local police and hero agencies in Nabu have advised that people continue to remain inside after dark. While this group of criminals has yet to target anyone other than heroes, it is still a possibility that civilians could be caught in the crossfire. Just last week, the hero Yoroi Musha was left with life-threatening injuries and hanging out of a 10th story window. It is unlikely he'll ever walk again, or perhaps even speak. More on the crime report, later tonight. Izuku paused very briefly when he heard that news. Yoroi Musha was a household name across Japan, and had been consistently one of the top 10 pro heroes for the last 30 years. He was a veteran with practically unmatched combat prowess, a paragon of virtue and honor and a masterful tactician from years of experience fighting villains. And yet, in the crazy world as it was, someone had been able to best him. Whoever Yoroi Musha had fought, they were supremely strong. The pro heroes could be shaken, after all. It had been a few years since the day in which the world came crashing down around Izuku Midoriya. 
The funeral of All Might had been and gone, a public outpouring of grief centered on a snaking procession through the streets of Musutafu. The world had seen Endeavor's head bowed as he spoke about taking on the mantle of Japan's number one, and the tear in his eye as he spoke of the sweeping changes which would need to come to society in the wake of All Might's death. Izuku, shedding his own tears, had been more focused on the old man at the head of the cortege, so small and so utterly crushed by the death of All Might. The name Gran Torino had not meant anything to Izuku before that day, but this man, All Might's teacher and a retired hero, had appeared utterly broken and yet so completely alone while surrounded by the finest pro heroes in the nation. As hollow as he may have felt on the inside watching the proceedings, Izuku could feel the man's despair even through the grainy sepia of the television screen. Before disappearing, Sorahiko Torino had been cornered by one of the more persistent media outlets, one of the less mainstream news stations who had less qualms about bothering a man during his mourning, and asked his thoughts. The impromptu speech that subsequently followed went around the world, and while the hero Gran Torino had disappeared completely from public life following this, his words of anguish were seismic in their impact. Toshinori Yagi was a blessing to us all. He might have been a pain in the ass to teach, and he was terrible at keeping in touch with his old teacher, but he was a true symbol of what our world could be. Hope, justice, peace, virtue, and above all else kindness. He wasn't just a symbol of peace, he was a light holding back the darkness. I fear for what we have in store for us now. Not for the villains who will crawl out of their holes and pester us I'm sure even I can take you on. No, I fear for the mantle of the symbol of peace, for the heroes who follow all might. There are heroes among us who make me ashamed of the name hero, who are not fit to hold a candle to Toshinori or follow his legacy. They are not strong enough to protect us from what is to come. It turned out that the incendiary and pained words of Gran Torino had been a true prophecy. Within a month of All Might's funeral, Ketsubusu Academy was attacked and bombed, resulting in serious injuries for the pro hero and teacher Ms. Joke. As other schools ramped up their security, villains who had been content waging petty wars with each other turned their sights elsewhere, and malicious creatures content to slip under the police's radar and not draw the attention of them were All Might felt emboldened. The old guard, the Yakuza, the drug dealers and the traffickers, all reared their heads to test where the wind was blowing, and they liked it. That had been within the first month after All Might. Now, a couple of years on, things were only going to get worse as more and more of the downtrodden end. Dastardly fancied their chances at glory in the new age. Taking a sip from his juice, Izuku kept on scribbling notes into his notebook while the radio played the news. He was still listening in case anything came up about Yoroi Musha that piqued his curiosity, deep down, he wondered if this was the same villain who had attacked Air Jet a few months ago, or the gang who had tried to take on Mirko only to be beaten back savagely by a very pissed off rabbit hero. However, with everything going on in the world he found that he was numb to new news, and wasn't getting shocked by it anymore. There were times he would tunnel vision himself away and focus himself intensely on the real world, to keep away from the crushing reality that the world was snowballing out of control, this was one of those times. Shaking his head, Izuku focused on the here and now. He watched his classmates, as he never tired of seeing how their quirks functioned and carefully estimating their limitations. This was all part of his continued hero analysis for the future, drafting up battle tactics, ways to counter their abilities or even complement them should cooperation become necessary. His notebooks were overflowing, and his eye for quirks was growing even more refined. There are so many useful quirks around, after all. Imagine what could be done if you had them. He still had no clue why those thoughts came into his head sometimes, or why he referred to himself as, you, sometimes. It happened more and more as he grew up, but he was trying to knock himself out of that habit. It wasn't good to be envious. Looking at his classmates anew, he could practically hear Tenko speaking in his ear, even when he wasn't there. Remember, good party composition is either balanced, or highly specialized. But all that's worthless without a good tactician making the battle plans for the troops to follow. Over a few months, Izuku had gotten used to Tenko being around more and more, weird video game vocabulary and all. He still had questions about the older boy, because he would freeze up and go into a depression any time that Izuku and Inko tried to pry about his home life. He wasn't going to pry though Tenko would tell him in time, if he wanted to. And anyway, it was just so good to see him so happy the rest of the time. 
Almost every night after his school, his new best friend would come home, dragging in board games and his heavy games console to share with Izuku. The world might have been going to hell in a handcart, but he was happier than he had ever been with any of his previous friends, and it seemed Tenko felt the same. The night that his mother told Tenko she was tired of him dragging a heavy bag to and from their house, and so was buying their own games console, the Bluenet's eyes had shone like fireworks. So here he was at break time, drafting up mock battles with his classmates' quirks by pitting them against each other, and seeing how many different scenarios he could create. He could imagine so many outcomes shifting his classmates around to face different opponents, creating different challenges for them to overcome, shifting who was fighting on the front line with who was organizing evacuations in support, the possibilities were truly endless. He just wished that he had someone else to share this with, to challenge his conclusions. Another mind to test his tactics against. There's nobody like that at this school. Cheek against his palm, he pouted at the playing students. Bakugo was trying to play with his quirkless friends, the same ones from three years ago, but they were about as lifeless as ever. Something Izuku could sympathize with, he knew all too well that quirklessness wasn't an easy diagnosis to live with. Still, it wasn't impossible. Having just one friend was an immeasurable help, and Izuku had more or less made that friend by accident in Tenko. It wasn't impossible. Or was thinking that sort of thing dismissive, now that he didn't have it so rough. Frowning at himself, Izuku sighed and closed his notebook, looking over to see that fierce red eyes were glaring daggers at him all of a sudden. Break time was about half over, and Bakugo looked angrier than he had ever seen him. Ever since the incident where Bakugo and his friends had tried to beat Izuku up, the day after the death of All Might, Bakugo had kept his distance from Izuku with gusto. The two friends, now sullen and cowering, flinched every time Izuku has tried to approach them to talk, Katsuki no longer bothered talking to Izuku, or engaging him at all whenever they were around. His mother and Mitsuki had noted it too, but prying from Inko, and yelling from Mitsuki, hadn't budged Katsuki one bit. He glared, and glowered, and huffed, and made it clear that every fiber of his being despised Izuku with a passion, but he never said why. Apparently today, after nearly three years, he had made up his mind that he wanted to say something. Maybe now, Izuku thought, he might understand why the boy he formerly admired as Kachan growing up might actually give him a chance to say what was on his mind. But as the spiky-haired blonde strode towards him and got nearer, Izuku saw the all-too-familiar look of the bully with fists bald and teeth gritted, and realized more accurately what was going on. Bakugo was about to fight him. Once by the green-haired boy's side, his hand clasped roughly down on his shoulder. Move. Knowing it would be worse if he didn't, Izuku gulped and complied as Bakugo practically threw him, pushing him along until they were both out of sight under a tree. Taking a deep breath, Izuku gripped his fists. Long time no see, Bakugo. What did I do this time? Rage flashed across Bakugo's features, his eyes bulging with his anger. You know why I'm here. You've not spoken to me for years, Bakugo. I don't know what you're talking about. Bakugo pointed at his two former friends, sullenly sat beside each other in the shade as others played around them. Tell me what you fucking did to them. Blinking, Izuku took a step back. He wanted to talk about them. What was there to say? Me. What do you mean, what I did to them? With a growl, Bakugo clenched his fists. You know exactly what I mean. Rather than explain, he just launched himself at Izuku. Stop playing dumb and own up to it. Izuku reeled as an explosion ignited into his shoulder and jostled him, before a follow-up punch wrapped in the ignition of Bakugo's quirk met his jaw, rattling his brain inside his skull. He felt a tooth give and staggered, flailing his hand up in front of him to catch a forceful elbow. Kachan, please, don't you dare call me that. You hurt them, Deku. You took their power. What? T their power. I didn't do any, another fist struck him, this time dangerously close to his temple, and a flash of orange from an explosion made him flinch with how close to his eye it was. You hurt them, you monster. Tasting blood, seeing stars, Izuku almost toppled right over. I don't even, admit it, you fucking Deku. Punch after punch, explosion after explosion, and Izuku could probably kiss another outfit goodbye. That's not my, an explosion right next to his ear made him scream, falling to the ground and writhing in pain as he clutched at his ear. This wasn't fair. He didn't do anything to them. He's a bully. 
He's hurting you. Hurt him back. I said. Bakugo was gritting his teeth so hard he'd practically forced them out of alignment. Admit it, Deku. Opening his eyes, feeling the world. Come back into focus even as his ear rang out in a high-pitched shrill, Izuku started to stand up. This wasn't going to be like before. He wasn't going to be Bakugo's punching bag. Not for something he didn't do. Stand up to him. Punish him. That's. Bakugo charged at him, roaring savagely. Not. Izuku turned and glared at him, his own eyes burning with anger. My. He jumped up, his palms outstretched and shouted in defiance of the schoolyard bully. Name. Before Izuku's palms even touched Bakugo's body, before the living warhead could even set off his quirk, something neither of them were expecting to happen happened. A burst of force blasted itself from Izuku's palms, an airborne shockwave sending both him and the raging bully flying. Bakugo's eyes widened as he flew before he hit the trunk of a tree dead onto his shoulder with a crunch and a sickening scream. Izuku, meanwhile, was launched backwards and skidded to a halt just before the fence of the schoolyard. Looking down, his eyes widened at something entirely new. His arms were scarred with burn marks and blood from Bakugo's attacks, but his arm tingled with something else, raw and untamed energy that made his hair stand on end. Dancing across his skin and weaving around his fingers, red and black sparks crackled with a smell like ozone, before dying down like the last embers of a fire and leaving him back to normal with his scarred arms aching in pain from the assault. He had powers. He had, a quirk. And why did it feel familiar? Good. Now we're in business. As Izuku picked himself up off the ground, Bakugo clutched his bleeding shoulder, and Izuku's eyes widened as he could clearly see his bully's arm hanging limp, dislocated by the impact with the tree. Despite the tears in his eyes from the pain, he was biting down any scream of pain using his sheer anger, instead manifesting it as a snarl of a wounded alpha male. Quote dot dot dot. What the? What the hell did you do, Deku? something long overdue asterisk 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 teachers arrived not long after the incident between him and bakugo alerted by the furious shouting of the walking time bomb when he popped his own shoulder back in dragging the both of them off for a medical examination and for an interrogation at the hands of the callous headmaster izuku was reprimanded and bakugo was coddled while the nurse checked to ensure there was no lasting damage to bakugo's shoulder or the ability to use his quirk all the while, the school faculty ignored the wounds on Izuku. Bakugo was their star for the future and for UA after all, the hero they wanted to take credit for. Izuku wasn't their concern at all. Pathetic self-preservation from all involved. Hands stuffed into his pockets, Izuku quietly sulked as he wandered home. He kicked a stray can, hearing it rattle and clatter against loose stones on the asphalt surface as he plodded along. What had once been a proud neighborhood, idyllic and maintained by people who took pride in their homes, had fallen to the wayside in the previous couple of years. Graffiti was in abundance running along street side walls, name tags mixing with anti-hero, anti-police and anti-government messages. At one intersection, a group of people dressed in rather rebellious looking attire who had gathered on one street corner gave him the occasional odd look as he muttered to himself about how unfair the situation was. He just kept his head down as he walked, ignoring them, it was safer that way as he walked through the rough neighborhood they called home. It really had been trashed recently, shop fronts were damaged, glass had been shattered, with windows boarded up in some instances following break-ins and looted. Doors had been smashed in on properties, and Izuku shook his head in sadness. As he saw people, shop owners and assistants, working to replace the locks or the entire door. At one point crossing an alley, Izuku saw a man in a trench coat and a weird face mask open a leather bag to let a couple of older teens peruse his wares. He tried not to gulp as he saw plastic bags with whitish powder, blue capsules which looked like bullets, and some other things he didn't really recognize. Drug sales like that were all too common, and something he would really rather avoid being anywhere near. If he were stronger, or a hero, he would have stood up to the masked man and said something. Instead, he kept walking, making a mental note of the alley name in the hope that he remembered it to be able to call the police later, to get them or a hero to investigate. It's a wonder the police can even keep up. They couldn't. But they were trying. Grumbling and sighing to himself, he completely failed to notice when Tenko had joined him, walking by his side in that classic slouch that he had gotten used to. Another fight with the jerk. Izuku nodded, and Tenko sighed. Need to vent about it. 
Izuku shrugged, unsure how much to say. Kept calling me, Deku, again. Tenko rolled his eyes. How original. Not like he's been trying that since you were tiny. Right. Izuku fumed, his outburst drawing some attention from passers-by, before he took a deep breath to calm himself. You'd think he'd come up with something new by now. Tenko raised an eyebrow. Did calling you that make you fight back? Somewhat self-consciously, Izuku nodded, and his friend sighed. Crap, he's just gonna do it more now. Groaning, Izuku pushed his palms against his face. Really? How do you even know that? Face flinching with sadness, Tenko drew his hood up over his head, chapped lips pursed in something resembling anger. I just do. It's always the way with those character types. Not quite sure what he'd just seen there, Izuku fished about for something else to say, and in his mind red and black sparks flickered. I have a quirk. In an instant, Tenko's gloved hands flew to Izuku's shoulders, stopping him in his tracks as he grinned wildly at him and shook him. Since when? He was so overjoyed the poor green-eyed boy almost forgot to say anything back. I don't know. He blurted out. It just, happened. This is amazing. What can you do? How did it come out? Are you more of a brawler or support type? I I. Izuku's shoulders sagged. It came out during my fight with Bakugo. It happened so fast, I d don't know how to describe it or how to really activate it. I'm kinda, at a loss with it. Rubbing at his chin, Tenko thought about this. Okay, let's go to your house. I have a plan. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Makoto Kobayashi again, for the evening report. Following the armed assault on the shopping mall in Kiyashi Ward by an unknown gang, we spoke to the pro hero Yukyu who attended the scene and apprehended some of the criminals. She had this to say following the flight of a few gang members lucky enough to escape her clutches. It was, horrible to see what they had done before we had gotten there. I'm thankful to Edgeshot and Death Arms, and to the Kiyashi Ward police, for the assistance in taking down the majority of these thugs, and I can only apologize to the families of those we were too late to save. We cannot let these people run free, but I'm so tired now. It feels like the world got a lot heavier, these last two years, and we are facing more than we've ever dealt with before. Not sure how well she's holding up there, folks. Like many pro heroes, Yukyu has been running herself ragged to catch up with the drastic increase in the crime rate across Japan these past few years. I get the sense that we may be seeing a temporary hiatus from the Dragoon hero soon, to save her from burnout. God knows she deserves it. Send her prayers and well wishes, folks. To her and all our heroes, still fighting the good fight no matter the cost, thank you. Inko wiped the sweat from her brow, frowning at the radio as the news played. What a world she was raising her son into, and what tragedy had befallen Japan since that fateful day when Izuku was right there at the fall of All Might. Would it ever end? Dinner was almost ready, but the boys were still outside playing. Setting everything aside, she went to the sliding door at the back of the house and went to call them from her garden. That was when she saw what they were doing. Tenko was standing behind Izuku with a notebook, one of Izuku's beloved hero analysis workbooks, while Izuku her baby boy was standing there with his palms outstretched, fixing his gaze at loose cans and empty bottles which Tenko had lined up on the fence. Izuku was making faces, concentrating, trying to make, something happen. Tenko, it seemed, was there to help. So, what did you do when it happened? Her son fidgeted where he stood, flexing his fingers about as his arms remained outstretched. I don't know. I got all mad and lashed out, my muscles just kind of, did stuff. Leaning against the doorframe in silence, Inko watched intently as the boys carried on. Hmm, well, do you remember what it felt like? Giving this some thought, Izuku nodded, then turned toward Tenko. Punch me in the face. What? Both he and Inko yelped, taking involuntary steps toward him. Blushing, shrinking into his own shoulders a bit, Izuku mumbled. Well that's what Bakugo did before it happened. Somewhat lost, Tenko looked to the only adult in the scenario, his eyes pleading for an answer. With sigh, Inko stepped outside and sat down on the patio. Izu dear, Tenko. What are you two trying to do? Tenko mumbled, but she still heard him. Trying to get his quirk to activate. Inko was up to her son and lifting him into the air in less than a second. You have a quirk. The smile on her face was impossibly wide, and she laughed with joy as she spun around, hugging him tight. My little baby. You must be so happy. 
As they continued to spin, Izuku felt his brain losing track of the planet. Dizzy. Dizzy. Blushing, clearing her throat, Inko set him back down. He wobbled so badly Tenko had to catch him. With a vigorous shake of his head, Izuku regained his balance. Ah uh, yeah, I have a quirk mama. It came out today. Izu, I'm so happy for you. Inko paused, and frowned. But why are you asking Tenko to hit you to bring it out? Oh oh, um, you see, it kinda, came out today because of that. Because I was only able to activate it after Bakugo, attacked me at school. With an expression of forced neutrality, Inko drew in a long breath. She had long suspected that Mitsuki's boy had it out for her son, and long suspected that her sweet-hearted young man had been forgiving the unforgivable from the explosion user for some time. This was the final domino in the chain. And what did your teachers have to say about his behavior? Hands to his pockets, Izuku grumbled. Nothing. I was the one who got in trouble for fighting back. A shaky, menacing, joyless smile perched itself on Inko's lips and she stood up with chilling slowness. The domino had tipped over. Children, mother will be right back. Then she went inside and dialed the number for the school, before hanging up rapidly and dialing Mitsuki instead. This was not going to stand in the least, not if she had anything to say about it. The school would come after. Hell hath no fury like a mother on a warpath. With his mother's furious departure, Izuku turned. Back to Tenko. Will you do it? Scratching at his neck, Squirming in place a little, Tenko's face twisted with anxiety. I I dunno, why would I hit you? I like you, you're my friend, you helped me out with my quirk and the gloves. I, sticking out his tongue, Izuku crossed his arms. Dragon Quest is a dumb game. While Tenko growled and stamped his foot, he did not hit him. Hey. No it's not. Ah. Izuku frowned. Thought that would work. Of course not. I like you more than that game, you idiot. Puffing up his cheeks, Izuku stomped his foot. Who's the idiot if you won't even punch me once? No. Why won't you help me? That's not help. I just wanna show you. Then show me. Tenko suddenly grinned, and it was alarmingly wide. Deku. He went there. This one is bold. Izuku flinched as he turned to his friend. What? Did you say? You heard me. Or are you just gonna stand around doing nothing? Deku. Summoning his anger in a blur of motion and a scream at the use of that name, Izuku turned his palms on the cans and bottles. Rewarded for his efforts, his arms once again crackled with crimson and black electricity, as a burst of rippling air lanced from his palm. A bottle shattered, the fence shook, and Tenko flinched. The fence continued to wobble afterwards, as Izuku panted for breath to calm himself down. He took a long moment to just inhale before releasing the air again with deliberate slowness, watching the sparks jump across his skin and relishing in their tingle. That works too. Thank you, Tenko. That was, so cool. The other boy breathed with a smile, laughing giddily, nervously. Did you figure out how it worked? Nodding slowly, Izuku turned his palms back toward the cans and bottles. I think so. Focusing, his eyes narrowed, the red sparking of light coiled around his arms and the shockwaves blasted forward through the air, sending cans flying along with just as many of their glass brethren. In the place of his green-haired friend, Tenko furiously scribbled down his observations into the notebook. Looks kinda like you can focus it. Izuku nodded, staring at his palm. Hard to say, it was kind of a burst earlier. Like a shockwave -er. Tenko smirked. An explosion. Rolling his eyes and sighing, Izuku put a hand over his face. Yeah. Snickering, the blue net scribbled down some more notes. Don't tell Bakugo he inspired your quirk. I'm not sure if he'd get angry or if his ego would inflate. Despite himself, Izuku chuckled a little, and with a smile loosed off another blast which further shook the fence. Thanks Tenko. I guess I've figured it out now. He looked at his palms and one spark which was running up and down each finger on his right hand. Focus hard enough and I can push the air from my palms to make an explosion of air. Maybe. Whatever it is, at least it's not determined by anger now. Tenko paused writing. That's fine, we get the air side of your quirk, but what's with the red lightning? Do we know? With a puzzled expression, Izuku looked at his arms, seeing the last sparks die down. Not really. I guess it shows up whenever I activate my quirk. Not having any better idea, Tenko wrote that down putting question marks at the end of everything. It's as good a guess as any for now. Then he grinned. 
looks like that doctor who said it wasn't gonna happen was full of it. Izuku's mind flashed back to the second worst day of his life, and he nodded resolutely. I'll train with everything I've got from now to get stronger. I can do it. I can be a hero. Tenko's smile vanished when he saw Izuku's face. Not like that you can't. Wow, you are really bleeding. Raising an eyebrow, Izuku looked himself over for any sign of injury. Where? Then, he tasted the blood. Blinking, he raised a finger to his lips and felt it dripping down his face. A nosebleed. Tenko nodded. Could be your quirk's drawback, not exactly great, but it could be worse. Chewing on his lips, he put his eyes to the notes and started thinking it all over. Looks fairly cut and dry, but I don't know the first thing about physics or quirks. Not nearly enough points in my intelligence score to be a wizard, like you. Wizard. Flattery will get you everywhere. Izuku smiled. So what class are you? Shrugging, Tenko gave an offhanded answer. A, probably just a rogue. Not burly enough for a fighter, not enough charisma to bard, cleric or be a sorcerer, my constitution definitely isn't high enough to be a barbarian. Holding up a finger, he almost looked bored. Only one option left, really. Not that my dexterity is really all that great either. When he noticed Izuku giggling, he raised an eyebrow at him. What? Smiling wide, Izuku just spoke plainly. You're such a geek. Tenko blew a raspberry at him. Takes one to know one, quirk nerd. As timing would have it, before the insults could get more childish that was that. Boys. Inko returned with a glass-like smile. Dinner is ready in the dining room for you both. Go ahead and start without me. Mom. Are you okay? Izuku had never seen her like this. Of course, dear. I've just had a lovely chat with Auntie Mitsuki. Inko stopped herself from shaking a little. I've got to go and have a phone call with her in the school now, dear. I might be a while, so I'll reheat my food when I'm done okay. Tenko's eyes widened, looking over Inko and the rage which clearly pulsed through her body at the outcome of what had happened. Remind me to never get in your mom's bad books, Izuku. Why you'll never be in those, Tenko, I promise. Izuku nervously looked at his mother. R. Are you mad at me mom? For what happened to Bakugo today? Mad. At you. Her face softened ever so slightly. Not in a million years, Izuku. They hurt you, and pretended to be blind to it, for so long. I couldn't be mad at you for trying to protect yourself and stand up for yourself. I'm so proud of you for getting to this point, and I'll support you getting stronger with your quirk no matter where it takes us. No matter how scary this world is. I love you mom. And I love you too, she replied, kissing his forehead and ruffling his messy hair, ignoring the groan from her embarrassed son and the chuckle from the teasing Tenko. Now let me go and fix this okay. He nodded, and urged Tenko to follow him inside, as his mother began to dial the school in the living room. I guess this is gonna make school a bit difficult, huh? Whatever happens, you've got your mom, and me, Tenko said, holding out a fist to bump fists with him as they sat down to Katsudan. Izuku smiled when he saw that his mother had made his favorite to try to keep his spirits up. That's a strong party, no matter what the boss fights throw at you. Thank you. Izuku returned the fist bump, and smiled gently at his best friend. I'm lucky to have you both. Nothing more needed to be said between the two best friends, as they sat down and began eating. The tune of Inko letting loose a dam of motherly concern and rage over the phone couldn't dent Izuku's happiness. The torment he had suffered at the hands of Bakugo and so many more finally stood a chance of being dealt with. He had made a best friend who he was sure would last a lifetime. And most of all, he finally had a quirk, a chance of making his dreams reality. He finally stood a chance of becoming a hero. Things were looking up. And so it begins, Izuku Midoriya. The best is yet to come. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Izuku and Tenko. Aged. 11 and 13. She. Ran. Hamiko Toga, at age 12, had suffered more than she ever wanted to. She was only 8 when her parents had screamed at her about her quirk, called her a demon and a freak for the gift that they had given her, and had beaten her as if to try to get it out. She had run away that day, only a few blocks, before being terrified by the sounds of a battle between hero and villain happening right around the corner, when she ran back to the safety of home, and found herself looking at a house which looked like it had been hit by a bomb, what remained of her world fell apart. The death of her parents in the rubble of battle, 
on the day the world had dubbed Incident Zero, had left her without a home. She was just another piece of collateral damage from the death of All Might, a piece nobody wanted or knew what to do with. She had been thrown towards an orphanage with little care or empathy from anyone involved, and when the orphanage learned of her quirk, their horrified reactions turned her experience as an orphan into the experience of a prisoner as well. Now, finally, she had been helped to break free by an unfortunate accident which happened to Sakura, another girl who had been left without a home following Incident Zero. An accident using scissors and a quick sleight of hand from Hamiko had found her with enough juice to take a face and get out of that hellhole. All should have been fine, and indeed was, until she got to an unsafe neighborhood and heard a pro hero in a white mask yell her name. She had been hunted down, and she was terrified. She didn't want to go back. So she ran. Please 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 don't be behind me. She said out loud to herself, panting between words as she was out of breath. Wildly whipping her head around, she couldn't see the guy with his mask anywhere behind her, and inwardly prayed she had lost him, that somehow the trash and debris piled up in this neighborhood had obscured her frantic changes of direction. They'd pulled in a pro hero to track her down and take her back. She was screwed. She reached up to her face and felt the familiar sticky feeling of the latest face melting away, her time limit running out at the worst moment. Purple hair was starting to shed itself and run with the fake flesh of the other orphaned girl as she ran away. No no no, not now. She ducked into an alleyway as she ran and crouched behind a dumpster, watching the rest of the grey gunk sluice off of her like a mudslide. Rubbing her eyes in disgust as she got some of the grime out of them, she ripped the backpack she had been carrying off and quickly pulled a black t-shirt and denim shorts on over some underwear, cursing the need for her to strip naked before using her quirk and how exposed it left her after use. She gathered herself, chucking the backpack into a pile of trash before smoothing down the creased t-shirt with one hand, running her other hand through her knotted blonde hair in a vain attempt to get it to lie flat over her ears. The thought of going out as herself in public, especially with a pro around, scared her shitless, her tongue ran over her front teeth, flicking against her sharpened canines as a nervous reaction. She straightened up, looking around the alleyway, before her yellow cat-like eyes widened at the sight ahead of her. A dead end. Oh come on. She would have to go back the way she came. Back where the pro hero, well, well. She stiffened at the sound of the dry male voice behind her, punctuated by the tap-tap of wood on concrete. She hadn't lost him, after all. Her pursuer was a lanky, skinny man with a shock of ginger hair poking out from on top of his white mask. A bizarre beige sports uniform seemed to be his hero costume, along with a weird green gauntlet on one of his hands, but Hamiko was drawn mostly to the baseball bat he was wielding, and occasionally tapping against the floor as he walked towards her. She'd seen him on the news before wielding that bat against villains he was the pro hero, slugger. Tap tap. Please no. She whimpered, nearly sinking to her knees in defeat. He ignored her. I thought this would be more difficult, going on how they described you. They said you were sneaky, and clever. But here you were in a dead end, with no weapons, nowhere else to run, and not even another face to hide behind. Hamiko could have sworn he was leering at her under the mask. I get to see the real Hamiko Toga, and I'm not impressed. Don't make me go back sir. She tried, but her voice was coming out weak and small no matter what. They hurt me there, don't make me go back, oh you're not going back. He scraped the bat against the floor twice to punctuate his sentence. Not after you attacked another little girl to get out. She gasped. I never touched anyone. Sakura, she cut herself in the week. I just, his voice was mocking, the tone of an adult who enjoyed the superiority he was having over a child. Oh sure, you tick off of other people's blood, and she just conveniently happened to have an accident to give you some. Sure. I believe ya kid. I'm telling the truth. And I'm telling you I don't care. Tap tap. You're going to the police, and then you're going to be dealt with, like the little freak you are. Her mouth fell open. He didn't sound like a hero now, there was prejudice and hate and venom in that tone. Huh, she wasn't ready for the smack from the pro's signature bat, a clean strike into her stomach which took the wind out of her and knocked her back into the dumpster, collapsing in a crumpled heels amongst the trash. You disgust me you know. She almost threw up from the hit. What did I do? What did I do? Slugger mocked her in a high-pitched tone, before resting his bat on her shoulder as if he was about to tee off a golf swing into her head. They told me about your quirk, little girl. 
You drain other people's blood to make it work, and you seem to love it. She couldn't help it. It was how she was wired, she enjoyed the taste of it when she used her quirk. She couldn't control liking that. I see can't help how I was born, mister, he bumped the bat against her cheek. Can't help it. So I suppose your parents are to blame or they. News flash, they died on incident zero, missy. The fact you turned out as such an awful creature ain't on them. Please. Her tears were welling up before they were cut short with a jab by the bat into her stomach again. Ah, you are dirty. Another smack with the bat. Broken. Another. Your quirk is a freak of nature, a villain's quirk. Another smack, this time so hard that she could have sworn she heard a rib crack. You don't belong, and you never will. Please. Please stop. Stop. You attacked me first, remember? I'm only getting what I'm due here, I I didn't touch you, says who? The masked hero gestured to the whole alleyway and the piled up bags of trash, and barked a laugh. Who are they gonna believe, you little freak? A pro hero with years of service, or a crazy little girl with fangs who ran away after drinking her friend's blood? Why? The pain across her chest was throbbing, but it was nowhere near the bitter upset she was feeling at that time. Why are you doing this? Didn't you listen? Slugger swung his bat over his shoulder and crouched down to her level. You were doomed from the start, little girl. A freak like you will never belong in society, not while you hold on to this disgusting quirk. So I'm gonna take you to people who will get rid of it, you got it. Quirk. Therapy is a wonderful thing, her yellow eyes widened in fright. I don't wanna go to, geez, you could be more grateful. I'm doing this to help you out, kid. Think of this as an act of charity on my part, okay. Charity. You're beating me up and you wanna get people to torture me, torture. I'm helping to treat your illness, you ungrateful little psycho. Her response earned another hit from the bat, this time into the shoulder, and she nearly howled with the pain. If I let you go, that sick mind and those sick habits will hurt more and more people. I'm taking ya to people who are gonna cure ya. I don't wanna be cured. She yelled, yellow eyes flaring in anger despite all her pain. I just wanna do my thing and live, love and be me, mister. So leave me alone. Oh little darling, I didn't say you got a choice. Slugger stood up, and leveled the bat at her like a sword so that the end was pointed into her face. Now are you gonna come quietly, or am I gonna have to beat you silent before I take you in? So this is what it means to be a hero these days. She flinched just as much as the pro hero standing in front of her neither of them had heard the new arrival who now blocked the exit. H help me, Slugger turned, in a combat stance. Can't you see I'm a little Jesus, what the fuck are you? The newcomer had been deadly silent on arrival, a red scarf around his neck and a tattered white mask fluttering gently with a cool breeze that seemed to stir in the alleyway. How he had arrived in absolute silence was beyond Hamiko he was wearing heavy-duty metal boots and plates of armor on top of a black combat suit, which should have been loud as anything. Between the hunched back, spiked black hair, bandages across his arms and the fact that the guy had no freaking nose whatsoever, he looked fierce. Badass, even. He focused his red eyes on Slugger, still clutching the bat. You're the pro hero Slugger, aren't you? The hero's grip tightened slightly. That's me, pal. Who the hell are you? His question was ignored. What are you doing to her? This little freak tried attacking me, the red eyes narrowed, Hamiko realized he was holding a knife now. I saw that she didn't. Don't try that lie with me, hero. Slugger grimaced at him, as if something had dawned on him. Hey I know you. We were looking for you in Tokyo, back along. You're that vigilante who dropped off the grid all the time ago, right? What was your name? Stetson. Stalwart. Stendhal. The raggedy man straightened up just for a second. The idea of Stendhal died a long time ago. You. You can call me Stain. Hey, whatever man. Slugger gestured with his bat, and nearly hit her in the face again. You don't know a damn thing about this girl, so back out of here and let a pro handle this. The newcomer, Stain, didn't move a muscle. I know what I saw, and what I heard from you. I'm going nowhere. He turned to look at Hamiko, sharp red eyes meeting her bright yellow in a gaze which somehow didn't send a shiver up her spine. Despite his appearance, and the intense glare, she didn't feel threatened. What's your name, kid? She gulped. H. Hamiko Toga, sir, and what is your quirk? The one he despises so much. 
I, she hesitated as the bat wavered in front of her face, but when it didn't move she swallowed and carried on meekly. I can transform into other people. I, need there be blood to do so, and depending how much I drink, I can stay transformed for longer. She had braced for the inevitable, the disgust, the horror that was usually directed her way. Instead, the skeletal face of Stain softened before her very eyes for a second, to her complete shock. For the first time in her life, a stranger didn't see her quirk as something to be feared, and there was no hint of pity in his gaze like there had been from the people who had tried to change her. He couldn't be, impressed. What a gift. Her eyes widened at that statement. E.A. A small price to pay from those closest to you, and you could become them. Stain looked down at the knife in his hand, and ran a finger over it delicately. You could be a great hero with the ability to disguise like that. You could be an actress, or a spy, or even an undercover cop. Your potential is frightening, Hamiko. The fuck is wrong with you? The pro hero in the alleyway clearly didn't agree with his analysis. Maybe freaks attract freaks, because how the shit are you telling me she could be something great? She hurts people with her quirk. The sooner she's put down, the better for society. She watched with wide eyes as Stain turned to face Slugger, and she herself gasped at the fury that had suddenly appeared in the eyes of the former vigilante. No, it wasn't just in the eyes, that wouldn't do what was in front of her justice to describe it like that. The man's whole aura had turned violent and apoplectic with sheer, unbridled rage. How dare you? H. Huh. Slugger took a step back, holding his bat in front of him as if to ward off the raggedy man. Hey man, back down now, I'm warning ya, I heard everything you said to her. I saw what you did. Stain took another step forward, lurching, and Hamiko saw for the first time that the man had a katana on his back. You call yourself a hero. No, I won't let you hurt her like that and get away with it. Slugger gulped, seeming to regain some fighting spirit from somewhere despite the malevolent aura coming off of the man in front of him. T tough talk asshole, but you really think you can take a pro on your own. I'll take you in and give both of you freaks to the police. Hamiko was surprised to see Stain smirk, and a long tongue come out of his mouth to lick his lips as if delighted. Oh really? Who said I was alone? Wah, spinner. As the man roared there was a blur of motion from the wall to the left of the pro hero, and Hamiko realized that another person clad in a blue hoodie had somehow been clinging to the wall vertically, hanging off of it and defying gravity. In a blur of green, this latest new arrival dropped onto Slugger and swiped down with a clawed hand, grabbing the bat and throwing it away to the other end of the alleyway. Slugger screamed as something punched into his right shoulder for a moment, before smacking the newcomer away with a palm strike into the trash bags in the alleyway. When the now-named Spinner straightened up and dusted himself off, Hamiko was struck by one detail about her second hero. Not that he looked reptilian, although the green scales and clawed hands were something she had never seen before. Nor was she shocked by his purple hair, which stood upright about his head like he had suffered an electric shock, or the massive sword which he was carrying on his back just like Stain. The thing that actually struck Hamiko, more than anything, was that he didn't look that much older than her he was still a teenager, and yet he'd attacked a pro hero for going after her. Spinner nodded to Stain reverently as he walked to stand beside the older man. People like this guy don't deserve to be heroes. Stain nodded. I agree. Did you get it? The older kid opened up his scaly right palm, and revealed what he had punched into Slugger a short knife with a serrated blade. He has this coming. Slugger reached up to his bleeding shoulder with a snarl, and Hamiko was glad she couldn't see his face under his white mask. What did you do you damn? In an instant, Hamiko was shocked to see an abnormally long tongue lap against the blade of the knife, as Stain tasted the blood on the knife. Almost immediately, Slugger's limbs wobbled like jelly and his legs completely collapsed underneath him, all of the strength gone from his body. Gah. So many emotions went through her head as she watched the hero fall unceremoniously into the trash. Horror that the situation had escalated like this, gratitude that these two had come to help her, hope that this may mean she didn't need to go back, but most of all wonder at Stain's power. He had used blood as part of his quirk to help her. He was like her. He would understand. You bastard. Slugger screamed from on the floor like a wounded animal. Is this your quirk? The hell did you do to me? Only what you deserve, Stain said, tossing the knife back to Spinner, who wiped it on a rag and secreted it back into his hoodie's pocket. Total paralysis. 
You won't be hurting her anymore. How dare you? Slugger's anger appeared to be mounting. You dare attack a hero on duty, you pair of villains. Villains. Us. Stain turned to the stricken pro with a snarl. The only villain I see is the one who beat a defenseless child up in an alleyway and threatened to torture her quirk out of her. And you think we're the bad guys? You're supposed to be a vigilante, Slugger sneered. You're supposed to help people, not attack pro heroes, I don't see a pro hero in front of me. I see a fake who bullies those weaker, someone unworthy of the title. Are you, Stain suddenly drew his katana from his back, and leveled it at Slugger in much the same way as Slugger had pointed his bat at Himiko, she saw how effective it was at silencing the hero. I tried to become a hero once. I saw how many did it for the wrong reasons, and it disgusted me. All those people in it for money or fame, who would never sacrifice anything of theirs no matter the cost, who would never do what needed to be done. I tried to tell the world what needed to be done. I became a vigilante and did whatever I could to hunt down and stop the worst of the worst. The heroes saw a vigilante and cried foul because I was doing what they should have done, because I wasn't seeking reward or glory. Because of the monsters we let become heroes. He stroked Slugger's cheek with the worn blade, gently. All Might was worthy. He was noble and pure and self-sacrificing, and we should have built a world around ideals like his. But you all failed him. When he needed your help most, you were nowhere to be found, and he gave his life to save us all from evil incarnate. A shadow fell across his face. You're not worthy of following him. Your prejudices make you weak and you defile the idea of heroics. You embody that flawed system we cannot escape from, where anything is excusable and where it's perfectly acceptable to trample on those less fortunate. Look at the ruin of our sham-filled society after All Might died, and tell me you have brought on a better world. You have failed us all, and you will pay the price. H. Hey now. Slugger's voice wasn't the vicious taunt of a predator like it had been with Hamiko earlier. This was the wobbling tone of a scared little man, paralyzed and unable to act, robbed of power. We can talk about this, TCH. And now you seek to save your own skin, rather than apologize. Stain lowered the katana to touch the tip over Slugger's heart, as Spinner shook his head in pity, no, that was disgust Hamiko could see. Society needs to be corrected, so that people can live in peace and happiness free of hatred and abuse. If nobody will stand against the fake heroes, then I will purge them one by one, until they all are gone with the villains too. You monologue like a B villain man, villain. Vigilante. Does the title matter? In a world like this anymore. Stain shook his head at the fallen pro. All I know is that this is our mission. If you are a hero, then I am a hero killer. As Slugger's eyes widened, Himiko realized what was coming and didn't look away, she didn't want to. As Stain pushed the katana forward through the hero's heart, Slugger crumpled, the light fading from his eyes as his head slumped forward. It was the first time Himiko had seen anyone die in the flesh, and the part of her which wasn't screaming about how much trouble they would be in if someone found them was drowned out by the part that felt, relieved. She wasn't bitterly gloating at the death of her assailant, but it felt just. It felt right. Stain left his katana buried to the hilt for a good 20 seconds, staring at the mask of the hero as if searching for an answer, before withdrawing it and wiping it on a rag offered to him by Spinner. One step closer. Hamiko propped herself up against the side of the dumpster, her back aching, and despite everything flashed a toothy smile to both Stain and his young follower. You, ah, I owe you both. The younger one, Spinner, acknowledged her with his own smile. Least we could do. We've been watching him for a while, but the way he treated you. We couldn't stand by and watch. Stain now turned to her, and crouched down to her level, keeping his back to the corpse he had just created. For a moment, Himiko couldn't read his gaze, and tried not to lose herself staring into those deep red eyes, or to unnerve her savior by focusing too much on his complete lack of a nose. Then, after what seemed like an age, the fire in those eyes softened. He was concerned. Quote dot dot dot. I'm sorry. W what for? We didn't step in immediately because we didn't know what your situation was. I listened for too long because he accused you of being a villain, and you got hurt. He rubbed a calloused hand over her bruised shoulder. I apologize. She winced. It's okay mister. Did. She paused. Did you mean what you said before you K killed him? Hem. About fixing society. About standing against abuse. Cleaning out the bad guys. His gaze became hardened, resolute. 
Without question. Can I get in on that? Spinner seemed to jump in shock at that. You're serious. She nodded, and with everything she had she knew that she wanted it. She had nothing to go back to and nobody looking out for her, but his words had struck a chord in her like nothing ever had before. I've seen the worst in people for too long, and I don't like it. I don't like not being able to live like me, I don't like that people write me off or want to fix me, that all my quirk does is disgust them. She took a deep breath and looked down at her feet. Please, Mr. Staney, Mr. Spinner. Shuichi. She turned to look at the lizard man. Huh. He nodded, clenching a clawed fist. Shuichi Aguchi. That's my name. Mr. Spinner just makes me sound old. She giggled, briefly cursing in her head how it hurt her rib cage. You're older than me, mister. Yeah, but I'm still young too. I'm the big brother type, not your dad. He jerked a thumb at Stain with a smirk. That's his job. You are not calling me father. Stain shook his head, turning away, but the corner of his mouth twitched ever so slightly. Just because I took you in and trained you. He took you in. Hamiko gasped in realization. You're a runaway too. Hey, yeah. Shuichi ran a hand through his hair. The world wasn't kind to mutant types even before Incident Zero. All Might dies, and society treats us like monsters even more. That's awful. Yeah. He pointed to Stain. This guy found me at my lowest and gave me something to believe in, and a roof to call my home. Never looked back. Since. Then you have to take me in too. She reached out and tugged on that long red scarf, pleading, making her yellow eyes as wide as possible. Please, Mr. Staney. For a moment the hunched man didn't look at her, before he sighed and turned to her. If you come with us, this will be common. We do things which are awful because they have to be done, for a better society. If that's what it takes then I'm in, she shouted, jumping to her feet with a fist bump before realizing with the beating she'd taken just how bad an idea that was. OWW. Stain rolled his eyes good-naturedly, before stashing his knife away and picking her up in his arms like she weighed nothing, Hamiko was surprised how gentle he was being. I admire your enthusiasm, but save your strength. We'll heal you up first before we start your training. Something burst in her heart, and she felt tears coming to her eyes for the first time in a long time, tears of happiness. You're taking me. The ragged man nodded, the corners of his mouth turning up ever so slightly. You can come with us. We wouldn't leave you out without a home anyway, but I like your spirit, young Hamiko. And I meant what I said about your quirk, by the way. Stain shifted his arm slightly to move his arm further away from her ribs. I'll tell you more about mine, when you're rested. You'll find we're quite similar, after all. She tried and failed miserably to wipe her tears while being carried. Thank you so much. It's the right thing to do. Stain nodded at her, before turning to Spinner. We might want to get the car here, rather than walk her down the street. Less attention and less pain. Yes sir. Spinner saluted, before digging a set of car keys out of a hoodie pocket and running off to the road at the end of the alleyway. We'll get you rested up in no time. He looked back down at her in his arms, and Hamiko felt safe for the first time in a long time. Even as the world threw its worst at you, you seized a chance to try to change it for the better with both hands. Hell yeah. Someone's got to try, right? I agree. His gaze softened. I'll feed you, give you somewhere to stay, and keep you safe. I'll train you, help you make the most of your quirk, teach you how to look after yourself. With just the one rule. Hem. My name is Chizom Akaguro. Chizom, Stain, or Sir are acceptable going forward. He smirked at her, suddenly, and caught her off guard. Mr. Stainy gets you double training. Dad gets you triple. She chuckled, as Spinner rolled up at the end of the alleyway in a beaten up old family saloon that looked like it was about to fall off its axles at any given moment. I might end up on double training a lot then, sir. His grin widened, and it would have looked sinister in any other context. Hey. We'll see about that. As Spinner came around to the side of the car and opened the door for her and Stain, Hamiko watched with wonder as Stain lowered her gently into the back seat of the car, taking care to run the seatbelt over her gently and not press down on the shoulder slugger had hit earlier. Entirely by accident, it seemed she had found someone who would accept her for what she was, someone who would help her grow in the face of that, who would support her and look after her because they genuinely wanted to, not because they had been told they had to. The world had suddenly, in the space of five minutes, gotten a lot less frightening and a lot safer for Hamiko Toga, 
and whatever happened going forward in the crazy, chaotic world. She didn't have to run anymore. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Hamiko Toga. Aged. 12. Thank you for listening guys see you in the next part.